uh, welcome to the BCS Channel Shab event. Uh, today we have with us Shagun Sudhani. Uh, he's a research engineer at Facebook AI Research. Uh, his research interest is in lifelong reinforcement learning, training AI systems that can interact with and learn from the uh, practical world and consistently improve as they do so without forgetting the previous knowledge. Previously, he, has also, he was also a graduate student at Mila and he was advised by uh, Jayan Tang and uh, Dr. Yush uh, Benjo. So, uh, yeah, uh, so I believe the first part of the talk, uh, the format for it is going to be we can ask questions to you after the talk, uh, like as whatever you prefer, if like uh, uh, during the talk or after the talk. I think it's easier if you ask me during the talk uh, because it would be th this topic may not be so common. Um, so, if there okay. are questions, it's easier to answer them right away. Okay, yeah. Uh, and the second part of the talk is is uh, uh, about asking questions in general about your research or research and career, and etc. Okay, I think we are good to go and start now. Sounds good. Uh, thank, thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So I'll, I'll share yeah. my screen now. Um, yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Um, you should be saying something called as closer, a uh, Google slide basically. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. I'm in the presentation mode now. So thanks okay. once again for having me over. Uh, I'm going to present a recent work we did um, called as, or titled as, uh, Taking a Closer Look at Code Distillation for Distributed Training. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, collaborators at FAIR. Um, so, so the high level setup is that we want to do distributed training. And the, this talk would focus on one way of doing distributed training and we'll see how that improves or, or what advantages or disadvantages this specific mode has over the more standard approaches or the more common approaches. So that's what the agenda looks like. We'll talk about what is code distillation, uh, why should we care about code distillation, whether any of this works, or, and if it works, then what's the next step? And um, questions are welcome at all time because this, this might be a bit of uh, unusual topics, so feel free to ask questions. Um, if, if anything is not clear, uh, feel free to interrupt me and I'll be happy to clarify it more. Okay, um, so I, I, I'm assuming that people know what distillation is. If you do not, please feel free to raise questions. But um, so we, we are talking about co-distillation and I'm going to explain co-distillation or motivate co-distillation in terms of distillation. So code distillation is very much like distillation, but with some conditions, it's, it's not exactly distillation. What happens in distillation is that we have a, a big model, a trained model, which we commonly call as the teacher model. And we use this teacher model to train a smaller untrained model, which we call as a student model. And the, the information, the target uh, from the teacher model is used to train the student model. So in terms of knowledge transfer, we could say that teacher is transferring its knowledge to the student model. So this is what standard uh, distillation setup looks like. What happens in co-distillation is we again have two models, but this time we do not have the notion of a teacher or a student. So we have two models, but we do not explicitly say that one of the models is bigger or smaller or one of the models trained or untrained. That's not a requirement. It could or could not be. So you have two models, model A and B, and unlike previously, the transfer of knowledge is two directional. So model A is providing some knowledge to model B and model B is providing some knowledge to model A. So it's a bi-directional transfer of information. So it is like distillation, but no teacher, no student, and the knowledge transfer is. And if we think about training from the point of view of model A, model A is receiving some signal from model B. So just from the point of view of model A, model A could think of itself as being a student and model B as being a teacher. And this is where co-distillation becomes similar to distillation because from model A's perspective, it is experiencing a distillation-like loss. So when we are training model A, I'm just writing a standard um, SGD update equation where I'm saying the parameters of model A at the K plus one -th iteration are parameters at K -th iteration minus the gradient of a loss. And this loss has two components. One is a standard supervised learning loss. So let's say you are doing image classification. Your model A gets a supervised learning loss corresponding to how correctly it predicted the, the labels from the target. 
and then it is getting a distillation like loss. Now, uh, so the first part is Y is a ground truth label. So Y and F theta of A at time step K, this basically gives you the prediction from the model A. So you're computing, let's say a standard cross, uh, cross entropy loss between the two. In the second part, you are looking at the prediction of model A, which is the second part F theta AK X, and you are looking at the prediction from model B, and you are saying that you want these two predictions to be close as well. Learning loss. The second component is more of a distillation like loss. Um, whereas in a standard supervised learning setup, you would not have this distillation like loss. So this is how co distillation introduces an extra extra loss term. Um, if, if anything is not clear, you feel free to feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you guys know about distillation. If you don't, please feel free to ask questions. Um, okay, uh, so I think. Uh... Like I do not know about distillation, so I like like some explanation on that. Okay, so should I talk a little bit more about distillation, or do you, do you think you have enough idea to continue? Uh, I mean, the presentation itself is twenty five minutes, so even if we take five ten more minutes, we would have plenty of time. Yeah, I think some of us are beginners here. You can just explain distillation once, short in a short. So the high level idea behind distillation is that. Uh, forget forget what I'm showing you right now. You have a model and you have a data set and you train that model on that data set. This is what standard training is. And once you have trained this model, there could be plenty of reasons why you do not actually want to use that model. And one reason could be that the model that you have trained is just too big. Uh, let's say you trained a BERT model and you have trained that BERT model, but once you have trained it, it's not really usable because uh, let's say you want to do a, a few thousand predictions every every minute, and BERT model is going to just take too much time, too much, too much infrastructure to use it. So what we do is we train a large model and using that large model, which I'm just calling as a teacher model, we use that large model to train a student model. So given any data point X, uh, the target that the student model is trying to optimize is basically the prediction of the teacher model. So had there been no teacher model, had there been no student model, you would have a ground truth. You would have a model, you would train the model using the ground truth and then you'll be done. In distillation, you train the teacher, then you throw away the ground truth, you just have the X, uh, the samples with you, and you use those samples, and you use the predictions from the teacher as labels for the student. So the student does not see the real ground truth data. It just sees the predictions which the teacher made or the, the bigger model made on those data points. And then the student model is trained as if the teacher model is the data set. And the, the reasons for doing it is, well, you may train a big model, but it may not be useful in practice. That's that's one of the primary motivations for doing distillation. If you have heard of things like distilled BERT, distilled BERT is basically a distilled version of BERT where the teacher model would be BERT, which is huge. And then you'll have a smaller model, which is distilled using BERT. Does that make some more sense? Uh, or is it still very ambiguous as to why, why this entire notion of teacher student is there? Yeah, I, I think so, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think we can go ahead from here. Okay. So, Sir, I had one question. Um, so, why is the distilled word model used? Like, what's its application? I understand that uh, we need a smaller model, but like, can you be more specific with regards to its application? Yeah, so let's say. Um, uh, just because you can train a bigger model doesn't mean you can actually use that bigger model. Um, again, to give an example, I think GPT model, if you GPT three model, if you want to use it for inference, which means you just want the labels and you do not really want to do any training on it, you will need a few hundred GPUs to just load that entire model, and that's not practical. I mean, you can you can do it during training because training is a one time job, uh, but every time a request comes, if you need so many GPUs just to process one single data points, that makes it impractical. So the idea is that uh, we, we can train a powerful model, but that powerful model may not be actually usable in practice because of the, the amount of infrastructure, the amount of cost that it needs. And in that case, you, but you still want to use that, you, you want to use that bigger model. Uh, so you distill that bigger model into a student model. Probably the question is, why are we training the bigger model in the first place? Why are we not directly training the, the smaller model? Is that the question? I mean, if, if, if our concern is that we would not be able to use it, why do we even care about training a big model? That's my question. 
yes. I'm just going to ask you. Yeah. So the reason you may want to, uh, when you have a small model or small untrained model, there is only so much so that that model can learn. So it's it's equivalent to saying I, I'm trying to make a very loose analog here, but probably it would help you understand. Let's say there are five thousand research papers that you guys have to read. And obviously, those five thousand research papers are all not going to have novel information. So there would be some overlap. Some information would be useless. Some would be very useful. And uh, and then the thing is, hey, one particular student probably cannot read through five thousand papers. So what we do is we say, hey, instead of one uh, student, probably a teacher would be able to. And again, I'm just making an example. It's a very rough analogy. Probably a teacher would be able to quickly skim through them, quickly understand what's relevant, what's not relevant. And use their knowledge to to teach the students. So we want to be able to use all the data that we have. But a student model, a small model, would not be able to learn on all the data. It would just run out of capacity. You cannot just keep training a model. Uh, so it would be a lot easier to train a larger model on a huge amount of data set. But having trained a larger model, we cannot use it, and then we transfer the knowledge to a student model. And it can be in, in certain cases. It has been seen that uh, training a small model from a large model works better in practice in terms of validation accuracy or test accuracy, as compared to training the small model directly on the raw data. Actual empirical gains. It's not just uh, it's it's not just a thought experiment. You can see empirical gains by doing distillation. So model trained with distillation would work better than a model which is not trained with distillation. So there are actual gains to be and uh, to be achieved here. Um, Shagun, we have a question in the chat window. Um, okay, I'll how do I go to the chat? So, yeah, so. yeah, I can tell you the question. Yeah, so, the question is, uh, this can be used to get a smaller, faster classifier, like. If the person trains a very small model based on Im ImageNet uh, pre-trained models, just to get a classifier for five to ten classes instead of a heavy hundred class classifier. Uh, I, I yes, it can be done for that as well. Uh, one thing is that the I'm not talking about the output distribution here. So it could very well be that the teacher and the student are all making prediction on a thousand classes. Think of bigger in terms of more layers, in terms of um, a bigger width in the intermediate layers. Uh, but yes, in principle, you could have uh, the teacher might be making predictions over a lot more classes as compared to student. That is possible. Um, so, is your doubt clear? All right, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so the, the key thing to remember is the teacher model is already trained. So you're not, uh, the, the phase where we train the teacher model is a standard supervised learning process. That's why I'm not mentioning it here. But once you have this teacher model trained, you use the teacher model as the target for the student model. So it's not fine tuned. It's not updated. It's only the student model, which is trained and the student model gets the signal from the teacher model. Whereas in code installation, First of all, there is no teacher, there is no student. Both the models, uh, well, one of them could be could be trained, could not be trained. There is no such restriction, and both the models are sharing knowledge with each other. It's not that model A is updating model B. It, it's a two way it's a two way interaction. Locally, from the point of view of just model A, it appears to model A as if it is only it appears to model A that it is using model B as a teacher locally. But when you look at the point of view of model B, model B, model B feels that it is a student model because it is getting some some data, some training information from the model A, which is acting as a teacher model. So from the individual point of views, they are both doing distillation. But from the from the overall sense, both model A and B are sharing knowledge with each other, and that's why we call it as co-distillation, distillation at the same time. So both of them are distilling at the same time. Is is that good? Uh, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, just uh, just one question. So this knowledge here refers to only sharing of the predictions that each of these models are making. That's all that is being shared. Yes. So uh, I, I would I would not even use the word prediction. It's like model A is producing some um, some representation, and that representation can of course be predictions, but it, it's in general some representation. Output of some layer, it can be an intermediate layer, it can be the output layer, and okay. it is 
transferring or it is providing that representation, that embedding of vectors that that let's say hundred dimensional vector to model B. Okay. So it not even be actual predictions. It can be some intermediate uh, output of some in intermediate layer. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So so from point of view of the individual models, they are doing distillation. Okay. So far so good. But why do we care about this part? Like, what's the great deal about code distillation? Uh, the great deal is the following. Previous works have shown that code distillation has an ensembling behavior. Uh, what does it mean? So let's say I have a data set, some data set X, and I train two models on that data set, model A and model B. And during testing, during inference, I create an ensemble of models. So I have model A, model B, and during inference, I would use both the models and I would average out their predictions to, to have the predictions from the ensemble. So this is case one. Case two is if you use code distillation, that is during training, if you are code distilling A and B, as I shown earlier, and after training, you just keep one model, either A or B, whichever one you want, and you compare their performances. So in case one, you are comparing A plus B, and the second case, you are just comparing on the other, on the other case, you just have A. So when you compare the performance of A plus B without code distillation with the performance of A, only A with code distillation, the two, the two setups perform similar. And this is interesting because we know generally ensembling is a, it's, it's like a free trick. You use ensembling, you get good performance. Uh, but in this case, co-distillation train models can do it even without using an ensemble. And it can again be an interesting thing because doing ensembling has a cost. Every time a new request comes in, every time a new data point comes in, you have to run two models or N models instead of just one model. So ensembling has some overhead. It is a bit expensive. Whereas with code distillation, you get similar performance without actually having to use multiple models during inference. So does, does, it, does it give a sense of why code distillation might be a better alternative to ensembling or maybe a useful alternative to in ensembling? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, so this is what previous works have already shown. A side effect of this behavior is that we can use code distillation for training models with very large batch sizes. And let's let's come to this part now. So um, I'm going to assume that you guys know nothing about large scale batching. So I'll, I'll try to break it down a lot and explain it. But if there are any questions, feel free to feel free to ask them. So let's say I am in a setup A. This orange block represents let's say one GPU. Uh, so you have a model which is training on one GPU and you have some data set and that data set remains the same. Now, let's say you want to use the largest possible batch size and the largest possible batch size that you can have on a GPU is, is some constant, let's say it's 32. Okay, just a number. Now, I train my model with a batch size of 32 on one GPU and let's say it takes eight days. And sure, it trains, but it's, it's slow, it's not fun. So what we want is, can I use more resources can I use a larger batch size and finish the training sooner? And the idea is you start with setup A with one GPU, which has a batch size of let's say 32, eight days is the training time. You go from A to B where now you have two GPUs. Since you have two GPUs, your effective batch size, that is the batch size across all the GPUs is now two times. So now it's 64. Our hope is that when we go from A to B, since we have a two times larger batch size, the variance in our gradients would be a lot smaller. So we would be able to use two times larger learning rate. And if we are able to use a two times larger learning rate, we should be able to perform just the just half the number of updates and still get good evaluation performance. So I'm using a lot of should here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm again and again, I'm saying we should be, we should be, we should be. So going from A to B, our batch size definitely doubles. And we hope that we should be able to double the learning rate as well. And we hope then that then we would be able to uh, reach similar level of performance by doing just half the number of updates. So the first part where the batch size doubles, that definitely happens because we have more resources. Whether we can or not double the learning rate, we hope in theory we should be able to. And sometimes in practice we are, but that's not a guarantee. And because we are able to double the learning rate, we should be able to perform only half the updates. When I say half the update, it's like saying, instead of training a model for 100 epochs, I can probably train the model for just 50 epochs now. So we hope that we are able to do that. 
and in practice it works it works to a reasonable extent so going from a to b suddenly by using two times more resources my training time has come down from eight days to four days and that's a that's a big win and that's that's one primary reason why we want to be able to do large batch training the caveat is that the performances should still match if the performance goes bad then it's useless then it's not not good for us and this is sort of a recipe so you can actually apply this many times over so you can do this thing again so for going from b to c you can again put in 2x more resources which means your batch size becomes two times more you can now use a even two times higher learning rate as compared to b and you can reduce you can hope to reduce the number of updates so we started with eight days we went to four days now we are hoping that our training would finish in two days and yes in theory you can keep doing this as many times as you want but after a point this breaks down and what i what do i mean by this breaks down is when you apply the trick again when you double the batch size you hope to double the learning rate you perform half the updates the model actually performs worse and a real life example is for example when we are training imagenet um we have the mini batch size on the x axis and on the y axis we have the validation error so obviously lower validation error is better look at each each uh, data point on the x axis as i go from 64 to 128 i double my batch size my evaluation performance after convergence remains pretty much the same and this this goes on all the way from a batch size of 2000 to 4000 4000 to 8000 even that is good when i'm going from a batch size of 8000 to 16000 my performance gets bad and it actually gets worse and worse from there on so i can i can use this trick but i cannot use this trick all the time there would be a point after which uh the scaling large batch size trick breaks down and then we cannot we cannot do anything from that point does it make sense so far yep okay so this is what we want to fix when we were going from c to d1 we saw that this cannot be done cannot be done in the sense of we can obviously do it but our performance suffers a lot can we do something else yes instead of doing if you if you see d1 i have eight gpus all training on one single model and this is just an example i'm not saying it breaks down at eight gpus i'm just showing an example uh, what we can do is we can train two models instead of just one but train them with half the number of resources so going from c to d2 you have one model which is in teal color you have another model which is in blue color if you see carefully the model in teal has the same number of resources. we are two times and on the box are shown as while doing just half the number of updates and to show it in terms of uh, uh, a a a table where we look at the number of gpus and the number of updates setup a let's say n gpus we are doing m updates per gpu you get n cross m updates b1 we double the number of gpus so the number of updates per gpu comes uh, becomes lower and number of updates per gpu is what decide how quickly the training up, uh, finishes so overall the number of updates remains the same but we are doing half the number of updates per gpu so the training finishes ideally it should finish in half the time in the previous work they double the number of gpu but they do not reduce the number of updates so we have to do the two times number of updates and we do not see any speed ups uh, but in this work uh, we show that when you double the number of gpus you can reduce the number of updates by half so b2 is similar to b1 going from a to b1 you were able to finish training in half the time going from a to b2 as proposed by us you can again reduce the amount of uh, the time taken for training um yeah so so this is this is what the point is that in this with this approach you can probably reduce the time for training in terms of wall clock time in terms of actual uh, cpu time okay um i would probably skip this slide uh, this is a bit complex but the point which i wanted to make here is uh, yeah actually i'm going to skip this it's 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 going to take a lot of time to explain this this the point here that i wanted to make was that uh doing code distillation style training could actually be faster 
not just because of the number of updates, but also because there is no communication. But uh, we, we we can ignore that part. It's uh, it will take a good amount of time to explain, and that's uh, that's just an additional benefit um, of of doing this approach. But it's not the the key idea. Uh, yeah, so we can skip this part. Okay, so I hope by now we understand what we are trying to do and how is it different from what others have done so far and where do we see expect to see actual gains in terms of time. The next logical question is, okay, all this looks good. Does any of this actually work in practice? That's a good question. Let's, let's see if any of this works. Uh, okay, so I'm showing you results on ImageNet dataset. It's a ResNet 50 model. Uh, the setup is based on this paper by Goel et al. It's, it's called as Accurate Large Scale Mini Batch Training. So it's it's one of the earliest papers which tried scaling ImageNet and it showed that ImageNet can be, the entire ImageNet data set can be trained in just one hour, I think with 256 GPUs. Um, so we are we are heavily relying on their setup. We are using the hyperparameters and uh, so that we do not have to rediscover everything. Uh, on the x-axis, you have the number of updates. You can think of number of updates as a rough proxy for the number of epochs. Uh, there are slight nuances, but at a high level, you can think of number of updates as a as being proportional to number of epochs. And on the y-axis, you have the validation accuracy, so we want the validation accuracy to be higher. I am showing you two curves. Blue is called as all reduce. All reduce is how you do distributed training with PyTorch regularly. I mean, the standard way of doing uh, distributed training, and uh, and it has a specific name. It's called as all reduce, but that's that's just a technical detail. And the orange curve is the model trained with code distillation. So orange curve is uh, at a high level, we can say that the blue curve is the model trained without code distillation. So blue curve corresponds to this setup, C1. Blue curve corresponds to the setup where you are training just one model with all the GPUs. The second case, oops, the second case of code distillation corresponds to this setup where you have two models, each using half the number of GPUs. Going ahead, yes. So uh, when we just try it, we see that it does not work. In fact, it works quite bad. I think there's a gap of almost one percentage accuracy, validation accuracy. It's not, it's not good. Uh, so maybe does it mean that code distillation does not work, or why we discussing everything for nothing? Uh, we 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 need to debug it, and when we debug it, we find that uh, in this plot, I'm showing you the training loss on the y-axis and the number of updates on the x-axis, and we see that. Even in terms of training loss, the model trained with code distillation is actually quite bad. So probably it's not just a uh, yeah. So so it's 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 not as simple as saying that hey the model does not reach the same level of validation accuracy. It's not even reaching the same level of training performance. And since it's not reaching the same level of training performance, it indicates that probably our model is overregularized. And to further validate that. Uh, we plot how much the parameters move in the parameter space when we are doing code distillation and when we are not. So the value on the y-axis is a rough approximation of distance covered by the parameters in the parameter space. And obviously the more you move around, the less regularized you are. And we can clearly see that the model trained with code distillation is, is exploring a lot slower or a lot smaller part of the parameter space. So this just validates our hypothesis that code distillation has a regularization effect, which needs to be fixed. And we fix that. And once we fix that effect, uh, I show you the performance once again on the ImageNet data set. It's the same as the previous one with, the, with one big difference that now we have reduced the L2 regularization. And now we see that the two performances are very close to each other. And that's a positive sign. And yes, we are, we are still not outperforming all reduce, but it's, it's very close and that's a very positive sign. Uh, if we try it on a next 101 model, which is a lot larger model, but still on the ImageNet data set, we see that the code distillation setup actually outperforms the or reduce setup. And now this is very promising because um, the, both the setups are using the same amount of compute resources and code distillation setup is able to outperform, uh, is able to outperform the more well-studied uh, or reduce setup, which is, which is where you use just one single model to and use all the GPUs with that one single model. And yeah, as you can see, all the models are doing same number of updates and everything. So, so this is very fair setting. Um, so this is, this is interesting uh, that with a larger model, we can do that. And one hypothesis is why we slightly underperform on ResNet 50, whereas this next 101 is ResNet 50 is a smaller model. And we know code distillation has a regularization effect. So probably a smaller model is hurt more as compared to a larger model. And then the next thing is, uh, well, uh, Goyal et al. paper on which we are basing this uses a very specific learning rate schedule. And we just wanted to make sure that the gains that we are seeing are not because of that learning rate schedule. 
So we also use the cosine learning rate schedule and keep everything else as proposed in Goyle et al. And in this case, we see that even on a ResNet 50 model, where we were earlier performing worse, our code distillation setup outperforms the all reduced setup. Uh, and yes, it's a, it's a very marginal gain in the sense where I shouldn't even say that it outperforms, but it's comparable. And it's, it's interesting that code distillation setup is reaching the same level of performance as a uh, non-code distillation setup. And these gains are even more pronounced when you look at this next 101 setup. Uh, again, everything remains the same. Instead of using the stepwise learning rate schedule, we now use the cosine learning rate schedule. So when, when we did these experiments, we were not hoping to outperform. We were just we just wanted to make sure that the performance that we are seeing is not because of a specific learning rate schedule. And that's that's quite interesting. And uh, this is okay. I can probably skip over this curve. The point of showing this curve was that you can use more GPUs per model and still reach similar level of accuracy, but uh, it's, it's not the key point. So we can probably skip over it. Um, yes. So so far the experiments I showed you were all in computer vision. Let's just try a bunch of NLP experiments as well. So this is WMT sixteen. Uh, English to German translation data set. It's a, it's a huge data set. I think it's a 4 million translation pairs or something. Uh, so it's, it's pretty big. And we are training a transformer large model. And in this case, the setup is based on uh, Ort et al, which is scaling neural machine translation. I think they showed that they can train this model uh, under five hours with 128 GPUs. So we, we are borrowing the hyperparameters from their setup. Um, and when we compare the, and this time we are plotting the validation loss, so lower the better. Uh, when we look at the all reduced versus code distillation setup, uh, we see that the code distillation lags initially in terms of the validation loss. Towards the end of training, it's a lot closer. The difference is of second place of decimal. Uh, yes, this was so by the time the training finishes, uh, the difference is of second place of decimal. Uh, another thing I want to highlight here is this model WMT16 is heavily underfitted, and we just stopped training after. I think 30, 26 epochs, uh, but by, by 26 epochs, when we start the training, the model is not, not complete, has not finished training, but it's just too expensive to continue training it. Uh, the other thing that we show is, uh, yes, so as we change the fraction of data set that we are using for training, uh, well, if you have smaller fraction of data, if you have smaller amount of data set initially during training, you, your model is more likely to overfit. And the regularization effect of code distillation helps you in the sense for lower amount of data, uh, your code distillation model performs better because it's not overfitting that easily. And maybe the point of showing this plot is that regularizing effect can actually be helpful depending on uh, how much data you have. It does not necessarily have to be a bad effect. Um, yeah, and this this plot just shows that the the code distillation results that we were showing you earlier they are somewhat robust to learning rate. So we can change the learning rate from zero point one to zero point two. The performance is pretty much indistinguishable. Zero point two to zero point four is is slightly worse. Zero point four to zero point eight is is quite bad, but at least from zero point one to zero point two, uh, we do not see any any difference in the performance. Um, we have some questions in the chat window, so I'm reading them out. Yeah. Uh -oh. In code distillation, is there any limitations on is there any limitations on the size of the two models? No. Nope. And the okay. so let me describe it once again. What we do is we use a fifty, for example. Both the models are SNF fifty, but in practice you are not required to. The setup is independent. You can have a ResNet fifty distilling with a, a ResNet to one hundred one, for example. We did not try those experiments. In fact, that's a future work for us. Uh, there's just another question, uh, which is what type of graph you observed in the training loss and parameter space graph in ResNex 101 model? Uh, let me come to this one. Uh, so the ResNet 50, so this is ResNet 50 without applying the regularization fix. After doing the regularization fix, the model, the, the loss comes down quite a lot. Uh, the shape remains more or less the same, but uh, it's just that the gap lowers down a bit. Uh, it does not code distillation training loss does not outperform all reduced training loss, and we are not surprised because remember the model with code distillation is optimizing two losses, uh, whereas the loss which I'm showing you here is just the loss on the on the training data set. So the loss here is pure supervised learning loss. So the plot definitely comes down. It does not outperform all reduced curve, and that's not even the aim. I mean, we we do not care about training loss if we 
as long as we are we are good on the validation of the test performance. So that is one part. The same thing happens with the less next one one model as well. Uh, the training lo losses are a lot more similar, a lot more closer, but uh, they do not. They, they are not the same and all reduce has a better training performance and that's expected. That's not a problem. That's not uh, something we are optimizing for anyway. Uh, I do not recall rerunning this experiment with ResNet 50 after doing the L2 fix. Uh, yeah, I, I do not recall uh, how the shapes look like. So I, I do not know. Sorry. Okay. I guess your doubts are clear from more than Shashank. So let's continue. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so far the point is, first of all, code distillation can be a useful alternative in the sense that when you look at ResNet 50 results, uh, sorry, ResNet 50 results, when we initially looked at it, uh, there was still some gap in the performance and one might argue that that's not a good thing because there should be ideally no gap in the performance or we should be outperforming. Uh, our point was to show that code distillation can be a viable alternative. And in the other experiments, we actually find that code distillation slightly outperforms. I, I, I'll still say slightly, or probably I should not even say slightly. I should say they are comparable because uh, 79 versus 79.5, or I don't know, 79.5 versus 79.7, it's not it's not a game changer. Uh, so for us, the important takeaway is code distillation trained models, because they're using the same amount of resources, they perform comparable to or reduce or to the standard distributed training setup. And that's interesting. Um, the, the contribution being that previous works you used a lot more updates, whereas in this case, we are not. We are using the same number of updates. Uh, there are some gaps. For example, in this case, uh, well, oops, sorry. Yeah, so in this case, we are still lagging behind at the second place of decimal. And again, it may or may not matter, but it would be more satisfactory if, these, if this performance gap would be even smaller. So uh, that's, that's something uh, we still haven't figured out how to do, and uh, we are still looking into. In terms of other experiments, it's it's interesting that it's somewhat robust to learning rate. Um, yeah, so so that's pretty much in terms of the experimental results. I'll quickly talk about what we think are interesting future steps, and uh, that would be the end of the presentation. Uh, so one thing is we talked about two-way code distillation, but really code distillation or distillation for that matter does not have to be two-way. It could be an n-way code distillation, so you could have n models co-distilling with each other, and that opens up very interesting possibilities. Uh, we haven't tried that yet. We are exploring that now and we'll, we'll see how that works out. And the second thing is code distillation between different uh, different models. Uh, and what I meant by that is, uh, I think earlier there was a question, do the models have to be the same? And no, they do not. You can have a ResNet 50 code distilling with something else. And uh, that's another thing we are exploring now. They, they were not included in the experiments we did so far. Um, I think that is all from my side. Um, I, I'll share the slides later, but uh, I'm happy to take some questions now. Uh, Shashi, can you ask your doubt? Uh, yeah, uh, Shagun, uh, is there was any learning rig settle you were using for the all reduce and code distillation steps? Yes, so uh, the, all, yeah. the learning rigs that we, sorry, go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, if you move to the slide in which you use cosine learning rule. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. yeah, so like in most of the cases, if you look at the plots, I mean, yeah, I can see that there is sudden jump in the validation accuracy around 80 to 90 uh, up x axis, but uh, it's for both all reduce and code distillation. But in the quotient learning route, right, why it's, I mean, it's uh, there is in the code distillation one, but there is, I cannot see any that jump or something in the all reduced one? Yes, so let me explain this a little bit. Uh, so let's start with this one. So first of all, what we are seeing here is, uh, and the reason you are seeing jumps is, the learning rate schedule comes from Goyal et al. Because we, okay. <coughs> sorry. Uh, so Goyal et al is that paper which trains imaginated in an hour, and the ResNet 50 model, that the setup of all reduce is basically exactly following the setup that Goyal et al does. Now, when we, uh, when we run our co-distillation models, we use the underlying setup as much as possible. So our, our intuition is that you have a way of training a model already, and then you want to try using code distillation with that. Instead of saying, hey, I don't know how to train a model and I want to start using code distillation right away. So we, we start with their setup and we just add code distillation loss to it. 
and that's why you see that in in the two cases that the jumps which you are seeing here they correspond to the learning rate changes so every time the learning rate changes uh, at this point the first point that you are seeing the learning rate uh, increase I'm, i'm just trying to recall whether the learning rate increase i think the learning rate decreases so the learning rate decreases from 0.1 to 0.01 at this point and then at this point from 0.01 to 0.001 so that's why you see these jumps here and we follow the same setup so if they change it from 0.1 to 0.01 so do we the reason you do not see this in this plot is um with the resonate 50 there is really no jump in the sense you you never arbitrarily change the learning rate a cosine schedule is used the reason you still see a jump in the co distillation curve is because we mentioned that we reduce the l2 regularization and it is this point at which we reduce the l2 regularization and uh probably the jump that you see is because the l2 regularization at this point is set from 1e minus 4 to 1e minus 5 a good question is why are we not doing the same thing with all reduce and yes we do and the model eventually underperforms in fact it underperforms to the blue curve as well so we have run that ablation where we run the blue curve again and we lower the learning rate at this uh, we lower the l2 regularization at this point and we let the model continue training and the overall model is in fact underperforming the blue curve as well forget about the orange curve so we have done that experiment and it underperforms okay thank you any other questions anyone uh one more question from my side uh did you evaluated any uh, adversarial robustness of model trained using co distillation uh why would adversarial robustness uh, like uh, you mostly mentioned in the very beginning that uh, distillation step happens to get better i mean accuracy for the validation case right basically when you use any teacher model to train student model right? oh okay. you mean the distillation phase at this phase ah uh, yeah so that could be probably because of maybe uh some kind of generalization the student model is getting from the teacher model if no let me let me not to kill your uh, you know kill your idea but the, the point is the reason we do distillation is let's say you have web scale data you have uh, i don't know you have the entire uh, web corpus and you want to train a small model uh, let's say a transformer with just three or four layers that mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry that model would just overfit way too quickly we sorry that that model would just not be able to uh what's the right way it it just would not be able to ingest all the information that you are providing it right like we, your your models have finite capacity your models have some size and they have some finite capacity the benefit of training a larger model is uh your huge humongous model would be able to use all this extra or this large amount of training data that you have which a smaller model would not be able to use so the the benefit of using this just cannot You 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 cannot uh, you know it's like saying hey I'm giving you an MLP a one layer MLP can you start training it on an ImageNet yes you can but obviously ImageNet data is too much for the MLP to handle so it's uh, that that's the mo that's the bigger motivation uh, adversary robustness I haven't thought about that perspective it may or may not be uh, relevant but really that the training distribution and the testing distribution are not adversarial so for example all the results we are showing it's the it's coming from ImageNet ah oh, yeah yeah. I do on this. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Thanks. Um. Hello. Um, I just wanted. To... Hi. Um. How was your experience working under Doctor Yashwa Benjio? Uh. Okay. We can definitely come to these things, but uh, because the, the reason is, if we are done with the questions on the slides, I can at least turn off the slide and actually look at people. uh so i'm happy to answer that but let's first go through uh the questions related to the slide and if there are no more questions i can just turn off the slide and stop sharing the screen so it would be a lot easier to interact when i can see you guys um, okay so uh, adding to this previous questions there have been some previous works which show that distillations can be used as a defense against uh, adversarial attacks okay so so i was is like adding to his question i was thinking whether you had done the same kind of study uh with co distillation also and whether 
in fact it's interesting that you brought up i did not even like yeah we we were not even thinking about that perspective we were thinking of how to scale models if you have some interesting references in mind feel free to put them on chat i'd be happy to read them uh, but this was not even something we were thinking about uh, when when we started the project okay sure thanks any other question anyone okay so i can probably stop sharing my slide deck and how do i do that uh, okay yeah. so can you not see my screen now um, yes you can still can okay uh, okay this is the one maybe okay now you cannot yeah you can okay great sorry yeah so the person who asked the question about yoshua um uh he is extremely humble he is extremely knowledgeable it's it's a great opportunity to learn with a person like him um yeah it's it's, it's just an incredible opportunity to learn from him he's he's extremely humble he's extremely down to earth so it's he he doesn't make you feel uh, yeah you you do not feel that pressure it's 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 very easy and very comforting to talk to him uh i hope i'm oh. still audible <laughs> yeah okay uh yeah i had a question so i was curious about uh, how does uh, this uh, research direction towards distributed learning is fitting into your uh, the overall research agenda of reinforcement learning yes so uh, i mean at a high level these things appear very disconnected and one could question hey how does this fit into this entire lifelong reinforcement learning yeah. thing uh part of the business is when we say lifelong learning uh okay. it is really lifelong learning it's not it's not saying one task two task ten task right a lot of the benchmarks that we have right now we would just create 10 permutations of mnist or cfar and we'll say hey that is lifelong learning one pet peeve i have with all these approaches is you beforehand know how big of a model you need you beforehand know how how much data set you can how much data you can see and if you did not know these things and even for the mnist example if you do not know how many unique variations of mnist i'm going to show you you cannot come up with a model size so there would come a point where you have a model and either you throw away that model and start with a larger model or you just say that no i'm going to start with a huge model and uh, i just hope that i encounter enough enough training data along my um, through my lifetime either way there would come a point where you need to scale your models so you cannot uh, live with a model which lives on one gpu it's 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 the same thing which i mentioned earlier the amount of training data that you're seeing is so much that the small model it's no fault of its but it's not it's not going to keep up with it so either you'll have to throw away your model start with a bigger model or you would start from day one with a bigger model so and if if that's the case uh, you you do not want to wait for your model to take 8 days to train on one single task uh, i mean just because it's lifelong learning doesn't mean it has to be as long as your life uh you want to be able to do faster experiments and so on so distributed training has to be there uh probably it's not so much so as a way to solve lifelong learning but it's definitely an important tool for the kind of experiments we want to do uh we want to do large scale lifelong learning uh not because it's large scale but that's that's closer to how real life lifelong learning is um, so it's 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 a tool it's an important toolbox that we need to eventually reach there okay and uh do you plan to extend it towards that direction yes yes so that's another uh another thing we want to do one one uh you know sort of catch in this process is uh we sometimes want to make progress too fast and it's like hey six months later we should have a model which can do this it's yeah. it's not it's not easy uh in the sense that a lot of these things are unexplored we we spent months understanding why the regularization effect is even taking place because other works did not report it and Did not find a new, new better back it up. Uh, so yes, we want to do it, but I, I don't think we are close to doing or using correlation for lifelong learning. But yes, we do want to. It's probably we will probably start doing it one year down the line or so. Okay. Okay. There's some question. Uh, I can yeah now I can access chat. Could you please walk us through how you ended up at Fair? Could you give an idea of how much computational power you have at your disposal? Uh, the second part is a bit difficult to answer. Uh, computational power depends a bit on the on the kind of projects you want to do. Um, 
uh, how did I end up at FAIR? Uh, FAIR has had, has, well, it still has an office in Montreal where I was doing my master's and um, I, I knew people there. I was collaborating with them uh, even before I joined full time. So as a master's student, I was collaborating with them. I knew people there. And then when I was graduating, I asked for an interview. They were kind enough to uh, give me an opportunity. So that's how it worked out. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a unique story or anything. It's just that you work with people. And when you're graduating, you ask, hey, are there job opportunities? And then you just apply. Are uh, there any other questions? Feel free to ask stuff. And of course, if you have any criticism of the research, I mean, you know, the, the point is not that what we're doing, doing is perfect or anything. For example, the adversary robustness thing, which was mentioned, we didn't know, I, I didn't know it. So it's, it's useful to have these kind of pointers. Uh, we'll at least explore them and see how that works. So if you have, uh, feel free to send them, send them my way. Uh, if it, is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, okay. I was curious how is time since I've been in India, but how is the state of uh, ML education or AI education in, for example, IT Kanpur? Uh, I, I know there are a bunch of good professors, but in terms of the general curriculum, is it easily accessible to people of other branches? Is it is it very closely guarded? How how is it working out? Um, so like, uh, the, the courses pertaining to machine learning, they are kind of, they, they, so there are limited seats. Uh, some professors open the seats for everyone, but some professors, uh, keep the seats limited. And then there are preferences, uh, uh, for filling up those seats. So like anyone who is, whose major or minor is related to computer science could easily get in, uh, rather than others who's, uh, who are not related to that. So yeah, but uh, but I I think that particularly in IIT Kanpur there are less number of professors to do ML research uh, in comparison to other IITs. Really, I mean I, I think you had professors lot sooner than or lot before uh, other IITs. Yeah, actually surprised. Yeah, uh, uh, actually a lot sooner than but like right now I feel the number is a little less over here. Okay. There has been a lot. There has been a large influence of MOOCs instead of formal coursework. What is an OC? Uh, no, MOOCs. So they are okay. online uh, online platforms like Coursera. Many people tend to visit them only because, as uh, the person before me said, it's sometimes difficult to get. And uh, those courses are less in number, and they are offered only in the third year and yeah. so on. Yeah, right. Okay, I, I, I don't know, for some reason I thought you guys have a lot more relaxed curriculum in the sense uh, you can audit classes a lot sooner from... Yes, yes, we can audit. We can audit for right from the second sem. Okay, I mean, so from the first sem. In, in theory you have, I mean, in, in, to say you have access to all the classes of senior years, but yeah, I, I can understand it. Just because you have access to classes doesn't mean suddenly everything would start making sense and it, it, it's a journey. You, you just cannot land in there and show up there. Uh, okay. And what exactly. kind of are you, uh, you guys or in general, the department or uh, professors are focusing on? Is it is it more on the RL side? Is it more on the cognitive side? I don't know. So, yeah. For RL, I believe there's no one in IIT Kanpur. And uh, like, uh, I, I think that most of the professors are, uh, uh, doing like two of the ML professors in CSC are doing uh, ML theory and uh, like mostly that deep learning theory and optimization and stuff. And so there has been a recent professor who joined this year only for NLP and there was no one earlier for NLP. Uh, there was, but I guess they reti retired for that. And yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's anyone for computer vision. 
Sashi can tell if anyone's there for confusion. Oh, yeah. There is no. I get actually there was some professors previously. Around three professors are there, but uh, they actually left. Uh, and like only one professor left here was Nambudri, but he was on sabbatical leave right now. So right now we do not have any professor in computer vision. And are the professors really easily accessible in the sense? Let's say you want to do a project. Are they are they approachable, or is it like no, take my class and then we'll talk about so that. not so for not so approachable for junior students, but I guess for fourth year and above they are approachable. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, there is one professor who works slightly in optimization and R so in electrical department. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So not specific. Zavat work very. uh but his background is more uh, in optimization not in yeah. rl but his some project works are in rl also but it's like uh, <laughs> he mostly work on rl for i mean those control applications in robotics or something i guess yeah well that's uh, that's sort of the theoretical side right like this all this comes from control theory or Then it has it has a good amount of ah uh, yeah I do it but like uh, if you scroll around his project works he mostly worked towards the optimization kind of thing not exactly <laughs> RL I I won't say that he works in RL yeah, we, I would support that so yeah I was just saying probably we can say he works in RL but not deep RL is that a more um, I I would say that it's a side research. It's it's just a sub uh, theory project in the overall theory we're doing. Like okay. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And you guys have this one year BTP system, right? Where yeah. you um you can be interning while you're doing a BTP project or something. No. Uh, I guess BTP is only for the MEC department. For other departments, it's only semester projects. Under UZP, we do we take a UZP for only one semester. It's not one year. Okay. Okay. One year so BTP like projects are given okay. for mechanical only. Uh, I mean, it's different for different departments. Okay. Got it. Uh, so, uh, like, I was curious about your journey to. uh ml research and how it started how how you got interested uh yeah so when i was graduating there was no ml course <laughs> the only okay. ml course was the most ml course was an artificial neural networks which was okay. all old school stuff um taught by an electrical professor uh so uh, when when i when i was graduating deep uh, sorry big data was a big thing uh 2013 14 15 that was the time when big data was like the hype okay. and uh, uh yeah i had basically zero ml experience i worked in adobe research for one and well, two years i i don't recall exactly but yeah approximately two years and there i got exposed to some of these ideas uh, the first ml book which i honestly or properly read was uh what's this name the carnan book um mm-hmm. data science or something something like that and that was less of an ml book more of a data science book uh, very theoretically heavy and so on uh, but that that was when i realized okay there is this thing and uh, uh, so at adobe research i got an opportunity to work on those things that was interesting uh, after that i came to montreal for doing my masters um i started with graph neural networks uh, i i i tried a bunch of things and i never stayed one area for long Uh, so I, I started with NLP, then I did graph neural networks, then I did RL, uh, then I did lifelong learning. Now I'm doing lifelong learning for some time, though. I mean, for example, the project I described, it's it's not lifelong learning; it's going to be lifelong learning in a long, long term. That's what my journey has mostly been: um, Adobe Research, Masters, followed by uh, Fair. Now, uh, one thing which has changed in the way I think or used to think is earlier I was going for very short-term bets. uh which is like hey this thing looks very interesting let's try our hands at that and that's that's a good thing that's an interesting thing but uh having long term bets is more important if you want to uh if you want to make long term progress so short term bets uh new technology comes new fields come all the time and that's that's good you should know about them but you should have a high level um research direction and uh, And by high level, I, I'm I'm really talking about years. I'm not saying one month, one year. I'm I'm probably talking about a time window of four five years. Uh, 
So you should know after four or five years, this is the kind of things that I'm focusing on. Uh, in fact, think of these things as mini PhDs. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you want to yeah. mention a PhD or not, but let's say you join a company or a so uh, think of your plans as doing a three-year or a four-year PhD, uh, which doesn't mean that you leave the company after four years, but it's like every you, you have a long-term goal and every once in a while you are reevaluating your position in terms of hey, how meaningful this goal is now and is it not meaningful if it's not, uh, what's the new goal and so on. It's very easy to get into this uh, comfort zone, right? Like for example, if you sign up for a PhD, you know, four years, you are guarded from everything in the sense of you, you're not going anywhere for four years. So it's very easy to get into this mode. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's one thing which I've learned over this that don't get into the comfort zone. Uh, people around you are not not just waiting for something to happen on its own. They are, they are doing things. You need to be doing things as well. Okay. Uh, so like in that context, where do you see yourself in the future? Uh, in terms of problems, lifelong learning. I mean, I think that's that's going to be that's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, we still, uh, I mean, I'm I'm grossly underqualified to uh, to comment about where the field is going to go. But in my own limited sense, the things that I'm interested in are at the intersection of lifelong learning and reinforcement. Not so much so because it's cool and so, but because that seems like we we interact, right? We interact with the world, and that's how we learn. Uh, so, uh, and it's years and years of experience before we before we start making these uh, meaningful decisions. And so, uh, so yeah, so that looks like an interesting thing to watch. But yes, uh, it it could be, for example, it could be someone solves the co-distillation problem in the sense, hey, someone has come up with a very fancy way of doing distributed training. So then probably that aspect is is something that I do not need to worry about. And I could say, okay, someone has solved it. Awesome. Now let's worry about the mold. Uh, urgent, urgent things. So, which specific projects I pick up, I don't know. But the high-level direction which I want to focus is this. And but well, the the field is uh, ever changing. It could be that this problem becomes irrelevant in some sense, and then then you have to reevaluate your position. That makes sense. Um, how many of you are planning to apply for grad schools or so, or uh, planning to join a search or something? If you have thought about it, <laughs> yeah, I think I am. Okay, uh, are you guys you also this year itself, or would you do it next year or so? This year. Uh, okay, so, so you guys know that there's a uh, th there are a lot of initiatives going on right now uh, from US universities to mm. evaluate profiles and so on. So make sure you take benefit. Yeah. Of Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's one thing which is a lot better now as compared to before. Earlier, there were the resources and the, the kind of opportunities were limited. And it's not that I'm complaining. I'm just saying you guys should take benefit of it because they exist now. Uh, yeah, you should you should benefit from it as much as you guys can. Uh, um, that's there, but although there's an exponential increase of number of applications that go for uh, this yeah, ML sphere. To be clear, I'm not saying your life is easier in the sense that you have more resources, yeah. your life is easier. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, there is a lot more awareness. When we were applying, when I was applying, when my classmates were applying, we, we had a rough sense of, hey, admissions are difficult, but we did not know how difficult. And it's, it's good that people now know how difficult it is because um, graduate studies is not the right thing for everyone. It depends on what you want to do, right? Like, I'm, I'm not saying one thing yeah. is better than others. Something suits you more than other. And if you spend a lot of time, energy, and then you go to a school that you don't enjoy, um, probably it's not. Uh, it's a it's a fast moving field. If you do a PhD at a place where you're not interested, uh, yeah, you're probably wasting your time. Uh, so the, the the fact that these these things are being talked about now, these things are more explicitly known now. It's it's a good thing, but of course, it doesn't cut down the competition. The the competition is crazy. No no questions about that. Um, what do you think of uh, the AI residency programs as compared to, uh, say, doing a master's degree at the university for two years? Or something like that? Uh, 
Uh, see, it's about what you are looking to achieve in the end. Uh, one way to look at it is, uh, at least in Canada, for example, if you want to do a PhD, you need to have done a master's. And I don't know how it works in US or Europe, but this is what has to be done in Canada, right? So if you are talking in terms of, hey, I want to do a PhD in Canada for whatever reason, you better do a master's because otherwise, uh, you, you need a master's. I should not say you do master's over residency, but you, you need a master's. So that's one, one hard constraint. Uh, the other thing is uh, residencies differ by uh, companies as well. Some companies do residency because they it's a, it's a cool thing to do, and some do it because they they generally care about um, you know providing the solid research experience and so on. So you have to figure that out as well. Um, in the terms of are you doing residency because uh, you you are already a, you already understand machine learning and so on, you want to be doing very uh, you, you want to be working on very difficult ideas or very uh, innovative ideas, or do you want to do residency as a way of breaking into the field? So that, that's another thing that you have to consider. All residencies are not equal, basically. Some residencies focus more on uh, more senior people, some focus more on beginners, some focus more on diverse candidates, some focus more on um, uh, you know the candidates who, who just graduated and who, are, who, who just finished their undergrad. Um, for example, MSR's program, I don't know whether they call it as a residency or not, but MSR India has this mm -hmm. research associate thing. Fellow. I think. Uh, research fellow. Okay, yeah. And I think they focus specifically. And so, so did Adobe, if I recall. Yeah. On the, no. They, okay, I'm uh, yeah, not being in touch with so many people now, but the, yeah, but, but certain programs would focus on certain kind of, uh, and, and they also focus on things like what you want to do after after your residency. So if you want to, for example, join the company, probably certain residencies do not make sense for you because they explicitly want you to go back to academia. So so you have to consider all these things. But yes, in terms of experience, probably uh, a residency experience could be a lot more meaningful uh, because in residency, well, it depends. If Do you like taking courses? If not, probably a residency is going to be a lot more fun for you because as masters, you have to take courses. Sometimes Indian courses are not even counted in US. So what that means is you would probably have to go back and take a data structures course again, even though you would have done that in your undergrad. And that, that depends on university. University, I'm not making a blanket statement, but there are things like this where you'll have to take courses and so on. And if you don't enjoy that, probably residence is going to be a lot more fun. If you enjoy classroom studies, then probably master's is going to be, or PhD is going to be a lot more fun. Thanks. So yeah, consider all these. Not an easy answer. <laughs> I have one question. So you did your MS. So why didn't you go for a PhD and for just for an MS? Uh, I think the problems that I'm interested in, uh, well, you, you, can, you can do a PhD, right? Uh, but I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel that strong need to have a PhD as a way of solving those problems. In the sense, I, I care about the problem. Yeah. And that's why I said if someone else, for example, solves a distributed part of it, I'm happy in the sense, okay, you have, you have made my life easier and I now I can go to the other part of the problem. So problem solving is what is more interesting for me, what is more important for me. If that means I need to do a PhD, probably I should. Uh, when I made that call, I did not feel that I need to. Uh, it could be a right call, it could be a wrong call. But the, the reason of making the call was, hey, I care about the problem. I don't care about... Uh, I don't care about the degree so much so. So if, if I'm at a place where I still have a reasonable opportunity to solve the problem, I'm I'm happy with that. And again, it could be a wrong call. I'm not saying I made the perfect decision, but I was I was emphasizing more on the problem which I want to solve and less on how exactly I solve it. So maybe PhD is a way of solving it. Maybe there are more ways. Maybe PhD is not the only way to solve it. And those were some of the factors I considered. Um, if, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong about saying that, hey, I want to have a PhD for the sake of having a PhD. I mean, that's everyone should decide for themselves why they want to do a PhD, if they want to do a PhD, or if not, why not? My reasoning was I, I'm more interested in the problem. I can solve the problem outside as well. So I'll solve it outside. I'll try to solve it outside. Uh, so compared to research in an academic setting and uh, an industrial setting, so where did you feel that uh, it's... The, the growth rate, rate is higher and on what factors do you base that? Not just growth rate because research is still very, um, you, you have a small team that you're working on a research problem with, right? Like even if your org has 500 people, 
it doesn't mean all 500 of them are doing the same problem and they better not be otherwise it would be crazy but um yeah. so in terms of immediate research probably things do not change a lot you still have to uh, you have to find collaborators as you have to find in academia uh you do not it, it's not like you come up with an idea and you you say hey everyone come work with me that that doesn't work so you still have to convince people that what you are saying what you are proposing is interesting so that part or uh, that challenge remains i think one difference is your what is expected of you and um for example i i i enjoy engineering problems i enjoy solving these uh some of these engineering problems as to hey this model is just if if you recall there were some slides which i skipped over right where uh, i said hey there is this communication bottleneck and so on in principle that communication bottleneck probably doesn't matter because maybe your model would take 8 days instead of 6 days and you know who cares i mean uh, it's not that we are doing something for two extra days or you could say no 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 i care about it because if i can finish training in 6 days maybe my life would be a lot easier i'll be able to run more experiments i don't know i i care about those things so all these small engineering changes which can make the performance better which uh, i care about those things and probably it's easier to care about those things in industry as compared to academia because in academia the gains yes your model trains two days faster but that's not going to get your paper accepted uh very often not unless it's an algorithmic advancement and not something of hey this was a wrong uh, i don't know configuration parameter i went to it and i fixed it so i i, I care about the engineering part as well and uh, that is what i enjoy working at fair uh of course uh, in a phd you can do the same it's just that uh, probably a lot of people around you would not care about it so it's it might feel irritating um yeah Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of finding your projects, finding your research direction, it's it's pretty much on you. No one comes up and tells you, "Hey, this is the research direction you should do." Uh, of course, if you if you say that, I do not know what to do. People would help you out, but it's it's they they are not going to tell you, "This is what you have to do for next five years." Uh, so you you still have a good amount of freedom uh, in terms of what projects or what specific problems you choose. Uh, so, like, do you see any difference in terms of the mentoring and two uh, setups? well the way we think about phd or at least when the way i used to think about phd was that there is this apprentice model so there is this sort of uh, you know a teacher of some sort and then there is an apprentice and the apprentice is working with the teacher and then the apprentice is learning but that's not how phd's work these days uh, supervisors are super busy uh, no fault of theirs but you know they are they are super busy so this apprentice model doesn't work uh, and a lot of times uh, you you are you are solving problems on your own and then of course they are there to help you out and guide you but it's it's not it's not the way artists i used to think yes. it's like you know you you meet them every day or something and uh, that's that's not how it is so uh in in that sense uh, i wouldn't say one is better or worse uh, it's it's about the specific people you are working with some people are more flexible and then you can you know for example book meetings with them anywhere you want some are more rigorous uh, which is not a bad thing but they would say hey before you book a meeting you should send out an agenda they want to know what they are going to discuss uh, it's and that that thing happens in academia as well your supervisor could be very particular and say look i want an agenda i want to understand what you want to talk about so that i i can actually contribute something so that depends on person to person i don't think academia is better or worse for that aspect okay one thing which i i realized is i enjoying working independently in the sense it's, it's not like i i avoid people but uh, yeah. uh even if my i don't know if my colleagues are saying that they would they want to meet once a week i'm fine if they say want to meet twice a week i'm fine if they say they want to meet once a month i'm fine uh so probably one one good thing is i i do not get stalled in the sense hey i need to discuss the next step and unless i have discussed the next step i i do not know what to do so so that that's one thing that works in my favor but uh for a lot of people when starting oh that's actually one thing i should recommend you you guys should do at least one year in industry before you go for your graduate studies uh not because industry is any better but you should have uh you should have experience of both the sides committing yourself for a five year program uh or a four year program um it's it's a it's a big decision and uh just having one year of industry experience even one year of industry experience gives you a good sense of what matters in the industry or not and of course if if some of you have decided never to go to industry and you want to be professor then probably doesn't it would not be so useful but if if you are more like hey i want to go to industry once i've done my phd or post or something i would suggest one year of industry experience uh, that's good I, and my industry experience helped me a lot so during masters i could say things like yeah this looks good in academia this looks good in on paper but 
um, probably no one in the industry would care about it. And that doesn't mean the problem is not interesting, but having this broader perspective helps. So yeah, so if, if some of you plan to come back to the industry after PhD or masters or whatever, you should spend some time in the industry before starting. Okay, uh, are there any other, <clears throat> sorry, are there any other questions? <clears throat> sorry. Are there any other questions? Um, do you guys have summer schools, uh, like the, the deep learning, reinforcement learning, summer school kind of things? Uh, I did not know about any summer schools until there was a recent summer school by Google this summer. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was also like a few days, I think. It's, it was not so long. So, yeah, I, I, if there are, I am not aware of them. Probably because I like search a lot of a lot for opportunities so i did not find it i believe that it doesn't exist in like here okay but you, you guys can actually suggest yeah. for the summer schools which are happening remotely now <coughs> sorry uh, so for example cfa does a very uh, good summer school every year uh, it's called as cfa okay. dlml summer school i can just probably write down the name and now that it's remote i mean yeah. the slides are anyway available after the school uh, yeah. Uh, that is the summer school where I, I got introduced to RL. I mean, I knew what RL is, uh, but that is where, uh, this is the summer school after which I actually started doing RL and, and I enjoy RL a lot. So a summer school can, can make a, uh, it can make a good difference in life. Yeah. Uh, so like, is it full-time, part-time or like how many, how much the duration? Summer school in summer. <laughs> Uh, okay. When it used to be physical, people used to travel to Montreal or Vancouver or what's the third place, Toronto, I think. Oh, sorry, not, not Vancouver, Edmonton, Toronto or Montreal. Uh, this year it was remote, uh, so I don't know how they did it. Uh, but but the, the good part is uh, the, the slides, the content is super accessible. I mean, uh, it's it's really a summer school. It's like they, they are not talking, they are talking about advanced sessions, but those are separate sessions and you, you clearly know whether that session makes sense for you or not. So uh, if someone wants to get started in DL, RL, those kind of things, or, or neuroscience, I mean, they have they have a bunch of uh, sessions. And again, I can vouch for it because I benefited a lot from the RL part. I mean, I enjoyed the DL part as well, but RL part is really, I started doing it after, after the CPA school. So that's why I'm probably vouching for it a lot uh, because I personally benefited a lot from it. Thanks, Shabun, for taking time off and asking and answering our doubts. This was very, this was a very nice session with you. Great. Thank you guys. And best of luck with your research. Um, feel free to, again, if you have any criticism of the paper, I'm probably just going to leave my email ID here. If you have any criticism of the paper, any feedback, anything, feel free to reach out. We are still all learning. Um, great. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.